My people, my people, what's going on? How's everybody? How's every little thing in your world? What's up, Trev? Watch you at work till I get called away. Oi, from Canada. Where in Canada are you, Nugent? What's going on up in, up in Canada? I haven't been up in Canada in a minute, you know? Yo, Lenny, what's up? I got a soda and a cheesesteak. Cheese I'm ready. Are you still out in Coney Island, bro? <laughs> you still out in Coney Island? What's going on? Hey, Jason, what do you say? Everybody, that tour was awesome. All right. Dorsten, I assume you're referring to the Slapshot tour that they just finished. So that said, hey, Chris Hoffman, what do you say? You know? Adams 85. Yo, yo, you know what was one of the best albums by a Boston band? Let me guess. Slapshot, old time hardcore. <laughs> uh, SSD control, the kids will have their say. Jerry's kids, is this my world? I don't know. 80. Salud is from Colombia. Love, yo. What's up with my people in Colombia? Fucking love Colombia, man. Yo, Monster, what do you say, buddy? What's up, Drew Stone? Powerhouse is on a way to play Boston. That's right. Shouting out RS70. What's up, boss? All right. In the meantime, what's up, bro? What's up? What's up? What's up? Where are you, bro? I'm at my brother's house today. Is I'm in his. Uh, is that I'm a rumpus his, room? I'm in his rumpus room downstairs. A rumpus room. What is a rumpus room? Any, what is a rumpus room? I haven't heard that in a minute. A, a rumpus. You don't hear that much anymore. Recreation and gaming and all that. He's got all his baseball stuff down here. And, a uh, rumpus room. Well, let me look I'm, that up. I'm getting caught in the rumpus. Rumpus. Why do they call it a rumpus room? Experts guess that the informal rumpus might come from the now obsolete word Robustious, which means boisterous or noisy, in the mid 20th century, children's playrooms began to be called rumpus rooms. Rumpus, not to be confused with ruckus. Rump, bring the rumpus, yo. Don't make a ruckus in the rumpus room. Shake your rumpa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep. yep. Awesome. Right. I was, you know what? I was laughing in that slap shot video. You know who we always talk about the pointer? That one had the clapper right in front of the cameraman. Like a fucking, like a fucking yeah. seal, right? <laughs> er, er, er. <laughs> from now on, when we play, and nobody better pinch this for me. This is mine. I'm gonna, we're going to do a song. I'm going to be like, I want everybody to point on this one. During breaking point. Breaking point. Yeah, that's it. Dur that's during it. the during the fast part of breaking point, you know. All that's right. my that's my incendiary jam right there. Yeah, I like that one. Yeah, thank you. We're getting ready to record soon. Anyway, meanwhile, on planet Earth, the Andromeda system. Actually, Earth isn't in the Andromeda system. I've been informed. We're in the Milky Way. <laughs> There you go. All right, let's do photo of the day. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, wrong answers only, please. This is photo of the day. Let's hear it. What do you got? Release the dogs of war. Right. Yeah, the rump, Lenny says... The rumpus room where kids learn real quickly not to stick a fork in the light socket. <laughs> some of us took a few tries to learn. Yo, and tell if I want to see some <laughs> rumpus in the pit. All right. That's good. Okay. Is it is it Murphy's paw? <laughs> I like that is, actually. Is it dogs of war? Is it doggy dog? Is it cheeseburger cheeseburger? No Coke, Pepsi. Is it what else? Great picture. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. This is good. It's a good one. I was there for this. I saw this the other night. <laughs> Fucking narcs. <laughs> is it the dogs the more? Oh, great band. Nice. Yep. I'm impressed. Yeah. Love those guys. Is it is it puppy muck? Not to be confused with mucky puck. <laughs> Who let the dogs out? Who 
let the dogs out. Dogs of War Detroit Hardcore. Okay. All Got a right. shout out. His name is Knox, by the way. That's Knox. That's, That's short Knox. For, short for obnoxious, she told me. <laughs> is it drug sniffers? Yeah. Dog was promised a Coney Island Frankfurter. <laughs> All right. Th that's that's that. But here's that. another one from this one I like. This this sort of ties in with that, you know. Um this ties in with that. Ah, here we go. Because if you could see what's going on in the background, then you know. That's is, part of their elaborate gun, stage set. <laughs> is it guns on the woof? Guns, guns, guns on the woof. It's funny. I'm wearing a shirt that says goats on the roof. Bark at the moon. Dun, 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 dun. All right. And here's one more from that. From that. Here we go. Boom. Bang. All there right. he is. Right, right answers. How about some right answers? Larry Kelly just got here. I guess it's a party now, right? Is it is it Amel and the Coke Sniffers? <laughs> is it Animal from the Muppets? <laughs> there you Drum go. Drum a mic. Yep. Is it the Car Bomb Parade? <laughs> is it the Car Bomb Parade? <laughs> it is the car bomb parade. All right, go ahead. What's up, Michelle? Michelle was right there with us too. The uh, this was the other night we were over in uh, in beautiful Coney Island on what was that uh, Friday, and it was a car bomb parade, Crazy Eddie, and the last stand at the Coney Island Brewing Company, and uh, beautiful night. You know there were some fireworks afterwards. We had a little bit of little threaten of rain, but it went away after only a few minutes. A threat in the uh, rain? Little, little, we were threatened by the rain a little bit. I was, you know, there he is. And the, uh, the singer for Crazy Eddie, our very own Chucky Brown, right? Yep. The, our, our encyclopedia of uh, information. Yep. You know, but uh, great, great day. All, all, our, all our friends just killing it. And, you know, uh, you know, it just, just a fun time, you know, and, um, I mean, really, just just all three bands. In fact, Car Bomb had a had an emergency situation, and their bass player wasn't able to play the show, and they soldiered on as a three piece. Yeah, and they they played, and they, they played as a three piece. Yeah, yeah they, they did it. You know what? They did it: guitar, drums, vocals, and uh, and Adea. By the way, uh, she's new to the band, and she's really kind of coming into her own. Oh, maybe we should explain. Well, that 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 was the last stand I just put up, but maybe we should explain. That photo, the first photo we put up, yes, it's a little, it's a little confusing. <laughs> with, with the uh, what's happening here is this is the singer in the car bomb parade, and this is her her dog who's pretty much a puppy, and uh, you know she's out there singing. It was an outdoor show, so she's out there singing, and the dog was just like flipping out. You know, yeah. So. He was he was when she that last song she ran around on the on the floor he was like oh, shout out was, to Jerry Farley who put the show yes on. absolutely he made the whole thing possible yeah and uh, Jerry was Jerry was in the pit the whole time he was jumping on the stage he's uh he's great he he put on a great show he also plays sometimes in a band called Annika that's really good yeah. too yeah. you know we I we gave away our tickets for um, Circle Jerks to go uh, to, to go oh to nice the other night you know. I could ah, not. I couldn't bear. I could not bear two nights in a row. <laughs> negative approach, seven seconds, and circle jerks again. Standing in friggin' uh, Irving Plaza, man, like <laughs> that was brutal. Br that place. You know what? How's this sound? Yo, fuck Irving Plaza. That place. <laughs> stuck. All right. I said it. See, this is a great band name, Hammer Smash. Hammer Smash. That's what my girl says. I want you to hammer Actually, there's a, there's a Cannibal Corpse song called Hammer Smashed Face. <laughs> it's a ballad. 
Here's here's a, here's another one. You took some cool shots at Coney Island. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. There we go. The steeplechase. Yeah. You know, I actually took that shot from the Wonder Wheel. I was on. Yeah, I, was, I, I, I was wondering where you took this from. Yeah, I, I was on the Wonder Wheel for the first what? time, probably since I was a little kid. When you go on the Wonder Wheel, do they give you an option? You can either go in the in the car that goes like this or the one that stays steady, right? Yeah, they said, would you like to be stable or would you like to rock? And I said, I want to rock. And I in the, in the future, I think I'd rather be stable. Yeah, fuck that, dude. I hate, yo, how's this, how's this sound? I hate rides like that. I hate <laughs> roller coasters and I hate Ferris wheels. Fuck that. <laughs> All right, <laughs> I did enjoy it, but uh, oh, it was wait, actually yeah, really yeah. cool. Yo, you want to hear a funny story about this? This you said this is la last photo before we get going with our guest. This photo here, right? <laughs> right, the bass player from Crazy Eddie. Right. Here's yeah. yeah Letty says Drew hates fun. I don't hate fun. <laughs> I don't hate fun. I just don't like. Go I just like don't like going upside down and all that. I just like. <laughs> You know what? How's this sound? That's right. I hate fun. <laughs> fun. Fun. <laughs> That's a great Murphy's Law song. All right. So here's the story here. Are you ready for this? Yes. <laughs> Buddy says, damn, you're on a tear today. <laughs> I'm taking no prisoners, man. So so listen, this story, this, this, yeah, fuck fun. <laughs> Yo, all right, check this story out. So, you see this woman standing behind him? In the flowery dress? It's the woman in the flowery. She will be further referenced as the woman in the flowery dress. So, at a certain point, I'm there um, with my girlfriend, and we're hanging out with, um, with uh, uh, John from Candiria and his gal and, um, and Mike the drummer and his wife. You know, I'm sitting out of the line of fire. I excuse myself. I have to excrete liquid waste particles, right? I go to the bathroom. And I go into the bathroom, and I walk, and I realize there's no urinals, right? So I go into a stall. I take a whiz. I come out of the stall, and this woman is standing there. And I'm like, oh, shit. Am I in the woman's bathroom? So <laughs> I ended up going to take a whiz. In the woman's bathroom. I went back to home. I said, ah, holy shit, I'm sorry. She laughed. She was like, yeah. She said, no, no. She said, am I in the men's bathroom? I, I said, no. I said, no. You're, you're, you're my bad. So, yep. That's, that's, the, that's, oh, the, that's, funny. that's the story with, with that. The girl like, in the flowery Ooh. dress. The girl in the flower. I'm like, am I in the women's bathroom? You got distracted by that circus mirror when you walk into that hallway. Yeah. Yep. Pretty much so. All right. Let's get it going, man. Let's do it. I'll talk to you in a bit. What's happening once again? This is the New York Hardcore. Once again, this is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, and we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush. DTFM Vinyl, Distro, Chacho's Tacos, Generation Records, 126 Hardcore Clothing, Grunge and Gribe Soap Company, and The Organic Grill. It is a vegan restaurant now located in the West Village of New York City at 133 3rd Street, right next to the Blue Note. Featured on in New York Magazine, New York Times, and Veg News, their dishes have won numerous awards, including Best Goddamn Veggie Burger. They make their own cheeses, sausages, and burger patties, and every dish on the menu could be made gluten-free. This year, they're celebrating the 23rd anniversary, and they're all about having a great time while enjoying amazing, clean food. They have now fully reopened for business and look forward to seeing you. Yes, you. Get in touch with them. Order some great food at www.theorganicgrill.com. Come on now. Since 1992, Generation Records have been a mainstay of the New York metropolitan area music scene. Today, they offer a diverse selection of new and used rock, jazz, indie, hip-hop, punk, hardcore, metal, blues, soundtrack, and reggae LPs, as well as T-shirts, posters, and other merchandise. They buy used record collections and music memorabilia and will pay you top dollar for them. Get that crap out of the house. House calls made for large collections in the tri-state area. Call or email generationrecords at gmail.com. Follow them on Facebook and on Instagram. That said, let's clear the deck. Let us bring our guest on the show. Here we go, yo. 
Boom, boom, boom. Let's not go back to my room. Today's guest is an American musician, record producer, tour manager, and barber hailing from the Granite State of New Hampshire. As a musician, in his proficient career, he is known for his work with the bands Street Dogs, Murder the Stout, Roger Moret and the Disasters, The Bruisers, FM359, The Kickovers, Slapshot, and currently True Intentions. As a tour manager and or producer, he has worked with the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones, Dropkick Murphys, and Flatfoot 56. Please welcome, coming at us from the Lone Star State of Texas, Mr. Johnny Rio. Hey, hey. What's up, Drew? What an intro. Holy crap. Hey, man, you know, <laughs> thanks for coming. I'm happy to have you on, brother. Man, thank you for having me, Drew. I appreciate you doing that. Yeah. How's things in Texas, man? Hot as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you know, it's interesting. I, you know, my first thought is you grew up in New Hampshire and you're living down in Texas now. I know, man. I know. I've been here since about 2004, too. When the Street Dogs started touring a bunch, we, uh, me and my ex-wife moved down here. And, yeah, I'm still getting used to it. But it's great. I love Texas. Are you I in, love are it. Are you in the Austin area? No, I'm actually just outside of Houston. I mean, I work in Houston um, okay. and all that kind of stuff. But, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the latest? I, I give it fill us in on just the latest and then we'll, we'll, we'll do a deep dive. I know you just came back to the country, right? Yeah, just came back. I mean, did the longest tour I've done in years uh, with Slapshot, Stars and Stripes. And uh, it was an instrument I've never really I've never really been a guitar player. So I had a lot of fun uh, getting back out on the road with a different band, different songs, different instrument. Just it was a nice challenge. Uh, and a good way to get back out there again. And really, it's the only Boston band that I haven't really worked with yet. So it's a kind of, <laughs> I shouldn't say the only, but you know what I mean? It's, it feels like I've worked with so many of my favorite Boston bands. And you know, I know a little bit, uh, I go back a little bit with Jack Kelly, and I, and I know he's not one to rehearse much. He's like, let the band no. together. So, so I'm assuming that basically the first five shows were like the first rehearsals. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 The first show of the tour, actually, we were, it was a show that we were playing, uh, in, uh, Sweden and we got held up at the airport and, uh, and it was right to stage and it was, it was maybe the, the worst show I've played in 20 fucking years. Like it was, I mean, by, by my standards, some, somehow like there were some kids after the show that were like, that was great or whatever. So, I mean, that was really practice was the first few. We, I did go to Boston and we got a few in, but uh, yeah, they def yeah, it was definitely, uh, it was different, man. It, I mean, look, the Packer and them guys, the only thing they kept saying to me was like, this is different, man. This is, we're here to have fun. It's, it's, uh, it's supposed guys, to be. And those guys like Packer, and those are your boys. I mean, you go, you yeah. go way back. Yeah. Those are like yeah. your buddies. Yeah. So yeah. I guess in a certain way, it's like, yo, just try to keep up with us, right? Like drums, right. bass, we're 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 like a we're like a fucking we're like a steam engine. We're going, just try to keep up. I'm assuming, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, listen, when Packer asked me to Packer asked me to do it, and he's like a little brother to me. I watched yeah. kid grow up, and good dude, um, good dude. really good dude, and and uh, and I I do anything for him, and and he. Uh, he asked me to do it at first, and I'm like, dude, listen, I could play some guitar, but it's – Craig Silverman, come on. I can't – dude, I can't t hold a candle to Craig Silverman. I'm a punk rock kid, you know what I mean? It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so uh, he was like, no, nah, man, you got this, and especially the old stuff, man. I grew up on some on old slap shots, so it was a – you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, in that sense, but uh, you know what I realized is, right as the pandemic was hitting, I mean, and, and we're we're sort of getting in front of ourselves, and we'll circle back to it. But I think one of the last tours that was out there before the pandemic hit was the Persistence tour, and you were you yeah. were out there, you were you were out there on that, right? Tell tell. So you were almost you 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 were out there on like the last tour that was out there, and uh, you know so. For a lot so, of people, man, yeah. 
Yeah, like that, not only was the Persistence Tour like one of the favorite tours that I'd ever done, it was, you know, AF Gorilla Biscuits, H2O, uh, the Count Time, Cutthroat, yeah. Billy Bio. Bill, Bill, Bill yeah, Bio. Billy was out. And so it was just a, it was a bro down, man. It was like we had, we had a hell of a good time. And we were sharing buses together. It was late nights, lots of laughing. It was just a great, great, great time. And we had like, so when we came back, that was in January. And when we come back from that, we're, you know, and there's not a lot of tours going out in the winter months anyway, but we come back from that a couple months later, obviously COVID happens. So we had this thing with every guy that was sort of on persistence tour where throughout the pandemic, we stayed in touch with one another. And it was very much like, can you believe we were, yeah, you know, we were on the only tour 2020. Like, it, 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 I'm so grateful that we had that experience together. It became even more romanticized after the fact, almost. You know what I mean? Like, like it became this, uh, yeah, shit, yeah. the only hardcore tour of 2020. And I, and but looking was, at looking at the photos, man, it, it, you guys look like you were. It, look, I I've been out on the road, you know, and and I see I see a lot of photos, but that looked really like you guys were having a great time. Oh, uh, really, man. Yeah. So toward the end of the, it was, it was rough with the street dogs. Cause you know, Lenny Lashley, he, he couldn't do the tour or he had just left the band and we had a fill in guy. Luckily his kid Gavin is awesome guitar. He plays in that senses fail band and he worked with us for years and he's a really good kid and a really great guitar player. This set's on a great night toward the end of the tour. Me and Mike, the singer, we kind of knew that, you know, uh, we weren't going to keep doing this thing for too long. So if we're going to have a last European tour, then like, uh, you know, or one of the last European tours, that was definitely like the one to play great. The shows were great. The hang was great. Like it was just everything about it was. If, if you went out on that, you went out on a high note. Right. Right. That's cool. Yeah. Hey, let's, uh, let, let's circle back. Let, let's circle back. Um, uh, how did you come up? Did you grow up in a musical household? Tell us about, uh, you know, coming up. No, not really. Uh, well, uh, yeah, my mom did, you know, she had like a nylon string guitar in the house. Uh, she did folk songs with, and somehow I learned uh, to Ramon's records. You know, I learned stuff on, and never really had a lesson or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, as years went on, uh, you know, got into skateboarding and punk rock and stuff. And I was uh, uh, at one point, like, you know, kind of living on the street and or couch surfing and or like, you know, just I had a hell of a childhood sort of in and out of facilities and all that kind of crap. And um, and I ended up uh, that band, the Queers, were from my hometown and Joe, is that, the, is, 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 is that, um, is that, uh, Na where, is that Nashua, New Hampshire, Manchester? No, it was, well, it was Exeter, New Hampshire and Exeter. out of Exeter, it's like, you know, five, 10 miles away from Hampton. I, Joe lived out in Northampton, B face, a bass player lived in Hampton. And these are all like, you could ride your bicycle to these places. And, sure. uh, and needless to say, like, I didn't really have a place to go or, and I had already left the high school at this point, you know, 16, I didn't really have any direction or any play. There was a, a punk house in our town called the no fun house. And it was really, uh, you know, super exactly how it sounds. Um, and then, um, yeah, Joe queer, uh, first he was first, he managed this restaurant and then he managed to take it over. And, uh, it was just like a diner thing. So he'd have us like, a whole roster of us like kind of coming in and not washing dishes for minimum wage and stuff. And, uh, and B face, the bass player, uh, God bless him, man. He like put me up at his house. I stayed on his couch. And as he was, he was kind of new to the queers and he was learning that stuff. And as he was learning these bass lines, I was just kind of standing there watching him. And he, him and Joe queer really showed me a lot of like bass stuff. And this is probably, is, this is, is like, why, is that basically why you gravitated to bass? Cause it, yeah. at that point it was, which, which traditionally, and you hear that like with Paul Simonon, you know, from the clash, it's like for a guy that's sort of like coming up from, you know, from the ground up, it's got, it's got four strings, two, two strings that you really play in hardcore, you know? And like, it's an, it's a, it's a sort of, 
Yeah. More of a simple bass instrument to play, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like I, at first, initially, I wanted to be like a professional skateboarder. So I ran away to San Diego <laughs> and I couch surfed and I did all this stuff trying to trying to do that. I ended up uh, when I ended up, uh, you know, basically kind of in a youth detention center type of spot. When I got out of that, I got a bicycle and the bicycle was still pretty much brand new. And I just said, man, I want to I want to be like Sid Vicious. So I sold the bicycle to somebody for probably whatever. It was peanuts on what it was. And I bought this piece of shit bass. And I just kind of, between B-Face and Joe Queer, is this those two guys era? really. Is this, is this photo yeah. from that era? Yeah. Yeah. That's the same era. Yeah. Yeah. You still have that jacket? <laughs> I don't. I don't know what happened to that jacket. But I feel, actually, I think my oldest child has it. Uh, and, yeah. Right on. Um, so, so yeah, continuous. Uh, so, so the journey continues. You're, you're picking up bass. And uh, what was the first kind of? Wasn't there a couple of bands that that you ended up in, in around then? Yeah. So, uh, and we had out of that no fun house, we had like these these uh, super uh, crusty sort of punk bands that we had back. You got to remember too, they were really. Aside from VFW halls and that kind of thing, you weren't like shows, you know, you weren't going to clubs or it was all basement shit or what. There, there was but, no but, Green but, Day. But there, there was, was no. Scene. But there was a there was a New Hampshire. There was a scene, scene. absolutely. Yeah. And, and I even even when I lived up in Vermont, uh, above, in in years later, there was always noticed there was there was a bit of a scene in in in, New, in Manchester in that area. Yeah, that was the thing that always got. Uh, that was the thing that always got us when we went to Europe. You know, because we would, when the bruisers would go to Europe, right? Like we would go there and it would always be, you know, bruisers from Boston. And of course, yeah, that we, you know, uh, that was where we cut our teeth and stuff like that. But we were like, nah, man, we're a New Hampshire band. At the time when I learned bass or whatever, or maybe a little bit past that or whatever, as he, as he got on from there, but there were only two, you know, at that time, like the bruisers were getting out and getting recognition in other states and, you know, other spots or whatever. And then you had the queers who were also yeah. starting to get that the pop punk thing was starting to get big and stuff. And, uh, uh, but yeah, it was, so it was like we gravitated toward pushing. And the funny thing is like for a regular person, you'd never draw any lines between a band, a lookout records band like the Queers and a, and an American Oi band like the Bruisers. Sure. But like at, at that time, you know, Richie and Sick Rick, who were in the Bruisers or whatever, they were helping the Queers out like on this like stage security back then. We would build stages and like put these shows together and all. Like we were so all just very. People, some of our people are asking what 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 are the years that what is we talking here? Just give me a. a so point. I think we're talking. Uh, probably 89 or 90 or something like that. Um, and then, I mean, not the, not when I was in the bruisers, I didn't join the bruisers until uh, 95, six or something, right, or maybe, right. yeah, some, something like that. Um, so, but uh, yeah, no, we're, uh, man, it was um, kind of out of that New Hampshire punk thing or whatever. Like uh, it was, it was it was great, and then um, moved out the, to Port. How does the and then sort of out of this? Uh, tell us how did the Bruisers kind of come in? Now the Bruiser, the Bruisers existed before you joined, right? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Nineteen uh, eight, uh, I think it's eighty eight when they started. And um, for you know, uh, there was a kid in my hometown. I was a sixteen year old kid, and there was a guy in my town, and you know. Obviously, I don't need to say like this is before internet and all that kind of crap. But you know, there was a guy in town who had like the stack of punk rock and oi seven inches. He had uh, this is where my love of motorcycles started. Like he had these old like English cafe racer books and stuff, and he had uh, real Doc Martens and like all this other kind of stuff. And he exposed me to you know a lot of the skinhead scene stuff. And I actually first heard the bruisers from him, this guy, Alex Fogg. And uh, when I found out that they were, you know, from, and then uh, the other bands that Al was in, I was, you know, uh, that's legendary New Hampshire stuff too. And 
Um, uh, but man, so, uh, yeah, the bruisers to me was like, um, that first bruiser seven inch was, you know, I, I love that thing. Um, and, and, and how, how did, how did the opportunity arise for you to join the bruisers? It's funny. Cause I, well, I, I had moved out to Portland, Oregon for a couple of years and, uh, I think we're going to 95, 96 or something like that. And I, I knew, I knew, um, you know, Al and the guys kind of before that I had a, a band called the uglies and, uh, Jeff bruiser produced it for us. We wow. put it out on the same label as cruising for a bruising and stuff, or we were, we were going to, or whatever. I think it was primitive records maybe, or my memory's fucked from the year. So I might screw up some facts along the <laughs> way, but, I'm, uh, I have terrible, terrible, terrible memory. But, um, so, uh, we had that band, the uglies and the bruisers really took us up under their wings because they were starting to do that more kind of American style with some influences of rock and roll and some lead guitar stuff and, um, putting a lot of that in the oi music. And, um, so we were doing that uglies thing with, uh, my boy, Billy Moon, Moonbeam and everything, Sean Hearn. And, um, man, out of that, I uh, had a develop a relationship with the bruisers. So when I moved to Portland, um, I don't know, man, I was, I'm a couple of years younger than the other guys and around 95 or so Al was having a hard time with his lineup. You know, the music was getting maybe a little bit too, uh, adult orientated or, or whatever, but at the same time, the climate within music, within oi music and punk rock was really, I mean, that's when, um, you know, a, a lot more people started taking interest in street rock and roll and punk rock and stuff like that. That part, that time in the nineties. And, yeah, um, and, and, and let me just, and, and let me just sort of segue that, you know, we're kind of talking that era, I think uh, in a certain way, thinking back when you say a lot of people were looking that way, I think a lot of people were looking that way uh, partially due to the success of bands like social distortion and, uh, yeah. you know, and, and we'll touch on that. Cause I know you played with Mike Ness a little bit there and we got a picture of that, but, I think it's safe to say that, uh, you know, having social distortion on a major label, you know, sort of really turned some heads, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But I mean, at that time, like I remember, uh, nobody would write about an oi band because it had, you know, correlation. People would think it was racism or, or, or whatever. So like you couldn't, you know, magazines like maximum rock and roll wouldn't, if it had oi in the song, it wouldn't, you know what I mean? So, but but then the '90s happened, and and all of a sudden it became not popular, but it was more accepted as part of the thing. So I, I came into the Bruisers with sort of a lot of energy. I was, uh, uh, like I said, a few years younger than everybody, and I was just like, let's let's go, let's do this, let's, you know, you're the legendary. For me, it was the most legendary New Hampshire thing ever. I mean, when I was a kid, and I saw those guys walking down the streets with you know, flight jackets that said the bruisers in old English on the back. I just thought that was the, I thought if I could ever get one of those fucking flight jackets, man, that would be the <laughs> best, you know, honor that's of my a, life or whatever. But that's exciting, man. That you, that, that's exciting. When, when we, when we see people that we're, that, that we're endeared to and we end up, you know, getting involved with them creatively and making art with them. That's awesome. Yeah. That, that, yeah, that, for that, sure. That, that, that's really, and, and I got to say, you know, we've had Al's been on the show, you know, Al's just, Al just has one of the most infectious smiles. He just, he just, he just, he's, he's just, that, he's that guy, you know, he's great. Oh, listen, he, uh, he remembers everything. And that's kind of when you did, when you were as young as I was going to Europe for the first time and doing all the dumb shit that people do or whatever, like yeah. it's, it's, it's both a good thing and a bad thing. Like, uh, he remembers he remembers all the dumb shit I did and he'll pull it up at a moment's notice. Doesn't matter who's around, you know what I mean? It's, but he's, you know, he's always, you know, there's been some years where I've had a diff, I've had a difficult time. Um, you know, there was years where I went to rehab going through divorce, like uh, I've been oh, through some too. shit in my life and, oh, you too. and uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Like, I, I mean, it's, it's not a very um, original story and, punk or hardcore but but he was he was always there for me and my family in that way you know what i mean even behind the scenes shit like he's just uh he's he's now 
from from time to time, don't you don't you guys dust the bruisers thing off and and, and do a, a, if 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 the hand calls for it a benefit or something righteous? Don't you guys kind of dust the bruisers things off a bruiser thing off once in a while? I mean, so the last reunion that happened uh, 2018 or or maybe 19 or whatever, a couple of years ago, um, the last reunion that happened was supposed to be the last the last one and um, a couple of Boston shows that Richie did. Right. And, uh, at the, that same weekend I had street dogs were playing that flog and Molly cruise. And, uh, so I wasn't going to play the Boston shows, but I was going to play the, uh, we had a European festival show, uh, in Eindhoven in Holland, um, sound of revolution fest. And, um, that show ended up canceling in Europe. But that, so that was going to be the one that we were going to do. I don't know if we'll ever make that up or, or not. Um, I know, uh, yeah, I'm hoping Al gets a wild hair one day. He said the, he said a couple of years ago was the last one. So, you know, we'll when, see. What was, were you, were you in the band? Were you in the bruisers when sort of, when, when Al, um, went to the drop kicks? Was that, was that, yeah. was that, yeah. that's, that must've been, yeah, an interesting, must have been an interesting time. It was an interesting time. Um, it was funny because we at the at that time we we were in Europe. We had just uh, we took we were on a tour. We took Blood for Blood on their very first tour. I'll never forget it. They were they were uh, support for us on this tour, and we were having the time of our lives out there. And Do or Die, that that first big Dropkick record came out, and they were touring with the business in the states at that same time, and. Um, I remember toward the end of the tour and, and I love that. I, I mean, I, I love that Mike McColgan era dropkick stuff. I mean, you know, the, the other early, stuff's great early, too, but I, early stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But I always, I, like, I, I really supported that band a lot and did, did a lot trying to, you know, I'm like everybody else, you know, and, um, uh, but we had, so at that very same time, dropkicks had signed that to, to, Hellcat epitaph or whatever. So we get to Europe and we're, I mean, we're meeting with the epitaph people in Europe. I mean, for a band like the bruisers were like, Whoa, like this is and then fucking 95 or six or whatever it was when I lived in a van, that was like the biggest thing I'd ever heard. Of. Like, well, it's like we said but, before that there was a lot of chum in the water in those years. Yeah. With epitaph and Hellcat and, you know, you know they were saw you know with the six with the huge success of of the epitaph bands and and offspring and green day and and uh and uh excuse me um uh, rancid and, right. and then, you know he got his offshoot label and you know a, a lot of a lot of bands were, were getting we were getting we were getting some love it was it was a cool moment there you know man we so and I remember Roger called Al on that run too. And he was like, we want you to do unity fest. And so we were like, Whoa, bruisers are going to do unity fest. And we might sign the ep We're talking to epitaph. Like, like this is crazy. And then, um, yeah, man, a couple, like, uh, the rest of the run went by and I think we had booked us filling in for drop kicks who had pulled out of that business tour. Cause, cause Mike left. So we were filling it. The bruisers were going to fill in for drop kick on some of the last ones. And, uh, and Ken, Ken Casey came to the show that we did at the Elvis room in, in New Hampshire. And I remember uh, telling my girlfriend at the time, I said, I was like, Oh, wow. Kenny came up to see the show. And she just looks at me. She's like, he's not here to see the show. He's here to see Al. Like, <laughs> and I was like, get out of here. Cause you know, back then, Al was, uh, I mean, Al is, uh, shit, he was doing punk rock music and street punk music for years while nobody paid any attention. So here's this band drop. So there was a little bit of that time. It was like, yeah, yeah, whatever with the drop kicks. You know what I mean? It was a little bit like, you know, this is, this is our shit kind of thing. And, uh, and I just couldn't see Al, uh, doing that or whatever. And I was like, ah, you're, you're tripping or whatever. So sure as shit, like the next day, um, cause at the time, I think my favorite band was the swing and utters and, and of course, a agnostic front, right? It's a little hardcore, but punk rock or whatever. It was sure, the nineties. Sure. Sure. And, uh, 
And so he goes, uh, Al goes, Hey man. And, and at the time too, we were kind of, there was some infighting within the, within the bruisers, just a sense of partying and being young and stupid or whatever. Sure, sure. And, uh, Al goes, Hey, what would you do if Roger called you and asked you to be an agnostic front? Right. And I go, I'd quit the bruisers and join agnostic front. And, uh, he goes, okay, well, Kenny asked me to be in the drop kicks and uh, I think I'm going to do like, I mean, it, it wasn't in the same thing, but he, yeah. he definitely made it known that I'm doing this because it's an advancement for myself. I'm going to be able to pay the bills with this band. I'm going to be able to. Ana- that was a good analogy too. Like yeah. agnostic front is to you is what the drop kicks are to me. And I have yeah. this opportunity and you know. Yeah, no, for sure. And, um, and, and that was it. We did our, we did our final show, uh, with, uh, opening for Ranted. Um, and I, I guess it was 97 or 98. Is this, so is this, is this from the last time you guys played out? That was from when we were rehearsing for that stuff that we did a couple of years ago or that we were going to do in, in Europe and stuff. So. Yeah. It must be nice. It, it must be nice to get together every now and then, you know, and and sort of, you know. Bet, it is. You know, yeah. That, especially, that. especially with the guys that, you know, twenty five years ago they went on to work in like Scotty is a really well respected banker now, and you know the other guys are sure. doing other jobs and stuff, right? Like they they got out of music completely, so like sure. to go from like I'm surrounded yeah. by this all the time still. And now I'm going back into that room. It feels really, uh, yeah. it felt like it did when we were kids. You know what I mean? I, I can relate. I can relate. You know, um, you know, some of us have continued on this jo- this journey of music and, 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 and art. And, and some of the guys we grew up with, like for me, growing up in New York City and in the Bronx, when I started the High and the Mighty, you know, in the early 80s, you know, uh, our bass player, Nick, uh, Nick Fury, uh, he, he, he had a job at 18 years old. He started being the doorman at the building, the Hayden up in the Bronx. Right. And yeah. Nick is still the doorman of the Hayden, you know, 30, whatever, 40 years later. And, you know, he, he, he's still there. And when we did the high and the mighty reunion, I knew where to find him, you know, yeah. uh, 212-884-1234. Hello, Hayden. Yo, Nick. <laughs> you know, so It was nice to, you know, sure. We had a couple of guys in the band that, that, are music guys, but you know Nick. Nick coming out of you know retirement hasn't played in years. It it, it had a nice um it had a nice feel to it for sure. Yeah. Oh, that's good, man. Heck yeah. Yeah, it's a similar flavor. It's it yeah. it brings it all back to why it was important in the first place. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and, and you go back there. Um. This now. Did you just just to sort of interject? Did you start working for other bands in the capacity of tech? tour manager was that sort of happening at the same time yeah no uh well man even back in the queers days or whatever i would really be kind of a hand in like whatever in fact i saw this i saw uh i saw uh, footage of one of those old queers shows or whatever uh in the in the late 80s or whatever and i'm there's this little kid runs up with his twin mohawk thing puts a head back on the cabinet and i'm like holy shit that's me or whatever and i I, so i was always kind of doing that sort of thing or whatever but it wasn't until like so i had this i had this fast forward to uh after the bruisers had had broken up and i was off doing that thing uh man i was sitting around my apartment in boston one day and at the time i started kind of practicing upright bass and just kind of messing around with a different instrument and that kind of thing. And uh, I was listening to WBCN in Boston for some unknown reason. And the Mike Ness is on there giving a radio interview and promoting an upcoming solo record. And he's uh-huh. talking about it. And he just go and I, the DJ just goes, uh, who's in your band? And he's like, we don't have anybody yet, you know? So or, or we had guys that, you know, recorded the record, but we don't have anybody yet for the, you know, touring band. Uh-huh. And, uh, man, I'm, I, I was probably 21 or two years old at the time. And, uh, 
I was like, ah, oh, fuck it. I'm just going to call a radio station. And I, and I pick up the phone. I call over there and I'm like, yeah, he says he doesn't have a band. Uh, I, I want to be in the band or whatever. And Ness got on the phone with me and he's like, I'm going to give you uh and I gave him a little lo- rundown, you know, bruisers. And I had done a couple of like minor upright bass things. And he's like, yeah, he's like, let me give you the, the info for my manager. Like, called the manager he fedexed me out a cd he's like can you be in orange county in a week and know these songs so i had to wait like two two days for the cd to get there and then i had like three or four days to learn this whole record uh on was upright this, bass. This, was this his solo album what was it called um cheating at cheating at solitaire yeah yeah, yeah. it's pretty good pretty and great record man i love it yeah and yeah. um and it, it felt really great too. Cause there was also that connection that I had had working with the bruisers of like a bit of punk rock, a bit of Americana and that kind of thing. And, uh, and I felt like, Oh, this is a great natural transition for me to, to, to push my music or, or whatever. Did you guys, and, did, uh, you guys, did you guys do all that stuff? Like you win again and, 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 uh, black, yeah. um, long black veil and all that, like great traditional yeah. shit. That's cool. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it was fun. And, yeah. and so like, I, I get out there to, I get out there to, uh, to Los Angeles and really hadn't been out there much at all. Um, before 21 years old, my friend drove me, like, I, I don't even know how I managed to get gear really, but I was just determined. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to go, like, I'm going to get there. I'm going to know these songs and I get there and I show up and it's the studio where they recorded mommy's little monster and i think the guy who was in the and you could see in the control room i was in the control room with their manager like for the the tryouts that were happening before me and it was the guy that was the session bass player for the stones the session upright guy that did Ooh. shit with the stones and the drummer from at the time the uh, royal crown review was really popping yeah, and it was sure. that guy on drums and i'm like man I don't have a fucking shot in hell. I'm like a self-taught punk rock kid. I got no business being in this room. I'm way, you know, way younger and way less experienced. But I, when the, when the tryout happened, I just played it exactly like the record. You know what I mean? And uh, I didn't do any of my own shit. I didn't freestyle nothing. I just. You played it straight. No for no. You played yeah. it straight. It, <laughs> and dude was stoked. He was like, wow, this is. That's that's exactly what I'm looking for, and I also the other drummer that was trying, he, he also had a vibe too. So that we all had a vibe with this particular lineup. Well, turns out the drummer couldn't do the gig, so we ended up trying out drummers for a long time. We ended up trying out probably twenty drummers, and then we get the guy Charlie Quintana, who ended up being oh, the, come the on now. yeah, yeah, but. At that time, I'm 21, and Charlie Quintana was, he was staying at, uh, at his, um, I remember he was staying at his lawyer's house in Beverly Hills or something. Like, he, he made himself sound like, uh, you know, Jimmy Page on the drums. or Like, he was just like, for me, I was just, I didn't fish out of water. I didn't know, but he was like, he, was, he treated me like, you know, hey, listen, you know, you dumb kid, come here, let me tell you some things kind of thing. And I really was a dumb kid. But so he would drive me, I, I was staying in, in Hollywood and he was staying in Beverly Hills and he would drive me in his lawyer's Mercedes Benz every day to practice in Orange County. And the whole way there, he would just be like, played with Bob Gill and I played with, you know, yeah, I, Izzy Stradlin. I was like, you know. Say, uh, born, born in El Paso, Texas. He was a member of the 1970s punk band, The Plugs. The he Plugs, was the, yeah. He was in the Cruzados, Izzy Stradlin, the Juju Hones. He recorded with Joan Osborne, John Doe, Bob Dylan, Cracker, Jimmy and the Mustangs. Uh, yeah. He, yeah, like, and then he joined Social Distortion. Man, so the guy who tried out right before him, too, was the, was that guy Adam Willard from Rocket from the Crypt, and then, yeah. you know, all the other bands he's played in, too, but right. he ripping drummer. He came and slaughtered it, and I go, I go, dude, we've tried out 20 drummers. I can't see how you're not getting this gig. You're right. So he was pretty stoked by that. And then the very next guy was Charlie. And Charlie had like every song set to a click track. And he was wearing these drum gloves 
and like he, he had a tech setting up his stuff and we were like whoa this guy is so sure enough he set the songs to metronome and it was like it was perfect like 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 the record right so he ended up getting the gig and uh man we were about a week into that into that tour we were a couple weeks into rehearsal a week into the tour and yeah i see charlie coming back after uh, i see charlie coming back from dinner uh in ventura smoking a cigar with with ness and I, for some reason i just knew i was like this is it for me man <laughs> he just went and got dinner <laughs> but 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 ness was super like he's been nothing but cool about it ever since he actually when i got fired from that job he was like don't ever stop if i can help you out in any way you know years in, in the years i will do it and he stayed true to that gave street dogs our first full u.s tour and like he gave me uh dd ramon's bass pick that was like a personal gift to him and he gave it to me and it just he was he's he was really cool about it. Yeah. So and, no. our, and, our, and our good friend uh, Lawrence uh, is is out with Mike yeah. right now. Uh, they, yeah. They're out doing Europe. Uh, uh, Lawrence, uh, you know who who also manages Sick of It All. Um, yeah. Street Dogs uh, manager too. Yeah. Right. That's right. And uh, he's out. Uh, is he? he is, he's TMing right. He's, he's yeah he's managing a tour right. Yeah. 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 So. And listen, I, so when that thing, when that, when that gig fired, when I got fired from that gig, I'm sitting in LA now and I'm like, I don't know what to do. I kind of fucked around LA for a week or so. And then, um, and then uh, went up to Oregon, saw my kid. And while I'm there, I get a call from, uh, the same management company and they were like, Hey, there is another gig though. And it's with one of the guys from the adolescents. Steve Soto, uh, rest in peace, and uh, and my friend Joe Sib and these other guys, and I heard Steve Soto, and I'm like, I'm like, man, yeah, I'm. What is it? I want to try that out. So it ended up being this band. I, I flew back down to L.A. tried out for this band. It ended up it wasn't a good fit or whatever. It ended up being that band Twenty Two Jacks. But anyway, I found myself oh, back in Joe, L.A. That's, that's Joe, Joe Sibs Joe Sibs project. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, awesome guys, and I've remained close with all of them and all that. But, um, but at that same time, when I flew back to LA for that, Al was coming through on the Motorhead tour with Dropkicks, right? And Al was having a hard time sort of finding his way with these new guys. Like it's a whole new band, new guys, new like they're all Boston guys. I'm a New Hampshire kid, and, and th there is a difference between yeah. New Hampshire and, and Boston kids, and, and uh. And so I was like, man, I, I got nothing going on. Why don't I come out and uh, and I'll tune guitars for you guys and just kind of be there for you and uh, and we'll hang out and whatever. So it just started this relationship with Dropkick where I started out as their roadie and just kind of went on from there to the tour manager. And then um, I even worked management with Aaron Hill with them for a while and just is spent this, years with, with them. Is this shot here? This is you and our old friend uh, Dickie Barrett. W were you working for them at this point? This looks like an old shot. That's an old shot. Yeah, and that, that's a couple years later. So, um, yeah, like after a couple years of working for Dropkick, uh, I saw Dickie and uh, Joe Gittleman at a, a Joe Strummer show at the Mescaleros were playing in Boston. And they were, you know, they were selling a million records at the time. You know, they were the biggest thing in Boston. And, uh, and Dickie and Joe were like, man, we'll, we, we just need a guitar tech at first stage manager, guitar tech. And, uh, it was like twice the money I made doing 15 jobs for the drop. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, at the time my ex-wife was kind of bagpiping with the drop kicks as well. She was their first bagpiper. And, uh, so she was kind of leaving that and, um, and and I went and started working for the Boston's, and then that kind of, yeah. That must have been a nice time to work for them because they they they, they were hot then. They they were really uh, they were they had a lot going on there. It was an exciting time for that band, man. Yeah, you know? and the best guy at the time of my life. I remain close with them to this day. Like this, you know, best best dudes. I go way back with Dickie Barrett, man. You know. Yeah. I mean, 
back to that original SSD control Boston crew. You know, it was. You know, uh, he was at that. He was at that uh, uh, fear show, that SNL show, and I didn't Dickie, realize that. Dicky was. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. I think he was mentioning that. I guess they they had put a because uh, I guess the New York scene at that. I mean, this is way before my time. I'm just quoting now, but I guess the New York scene was really pretty small back then. So they wanted to really put a lot of people in that room for that. So they were I, apparently they were calling DC and Boston well, and DC, just, yeah. DC DC came up for it. Yeah, and and yeah. I guess some Boston people went down. Yeah, it was a legendary show, and uh, they made. Yeah. Uh, they made they made quite a ruckus, but hey, let's. Uh, it's the top of the hour. Let me take a sponsor break. Let me shout out some sponsors. Talk about some upcoming shows, and let's come back and let's bring on Sid the Kid, and we'll do album of the week, and we'll we'll talk about Roger Moret and the disasters and some other stuff as well. All right. Hell yeah. See you in a couple. All right, man. There you have it. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles live. Our guest today is Johnny Rio, and uh, we're going deep. And I hope you're enjoying it at least half as much as I am. We are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Chacho's Tacos, Generation Records, Grunge and Gribe, Soap Company, and 126 Hardcore Clothing. It's a streetwear band for restless individuals who don't compromise like you, my hardcore friend. They are about being positive, spontaneous, and true to yourself. For years, they experimented with several printing methods and materials and collaborated with a large number of designers and illustrators, always giving room for fresh perspectives while retaining the hardcore attitude. Get in touch with them. Ramp up your game at www.126hardcoreclothing.com. Come on now. New York Hardcore Comics opened in 2013 selling comic books, punk rock and hardcore memorabilia, toys, statues, skateboard decks, tapes, vinyl, and all things horror. We love helping bands push their demos and new tracks, so please stop by and drop off your new music. We have in-store events like Magic the Gathering and Warhammer tournaments, plus meet and greets with some live performances. Open seven days a week and shipping worldwide. Find us online through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and eBay. Located at 117 Main Street in lovely Dobbs Ferry, New York, www.newyorkhardcorecomics.com. Last but not least, DTF and Vinyl Distro is a record store that specializes in underground music, punk, ska, hardcore, metal and more. Located in the heart of Fargo, North Dakota's Industrial District, shop in person online at www.dtfmvinyldistrict.com, where the motto is death to false metal. want to mention the next four shows. There will be no show this Wednesday, but we'll be coming back strong a week from today with Mr. Nate Newton. Let me clear the deck so I can tell you all about it. Nate Newton will be on the show a week from today, July 17th. Converge, uh, Jesuit, Old Man Gloom, uh, Doom Riders, Cave-In, and Cavalera Conspiracy. Then, uh, a Wednesday show. Hallelujah, brothers and sisters. The lovely Catherine Popper will be on the show. Puss in Boots, Ryan Adams, Jesse Mallon, Grace Potter, Willie Nelson, Jack White. Uh, incredible bass player. Uh, the girls will have their say. John Gooseman. Uh, artist and musician, Rule Em All, Restless Spirit, Dead Last, and John the Movie is on uh, Wednesday, July 27th. And our old friend, back again, he was on when we uh, we did a boxing show very early on, um, probably when the, in the first 25 shows. I don't know if you remember, we did a boxing show with my dad, Craig Satari, um, and uh, Sean from uh, The Promoter, and, uh, and Don Foos. We're bringing Don back. Uh, he has a new band, One Life All In. He has a new book out. Of course, he was in the Spud Monsters as well. So we got Don uh, coming in as well. If you're wondering how to support this show, I'm sure you are. Um, please, there is a Patreon page. There it is. And if you are a patron on Patreon um, and you do, the book is free. The New York Hardcore Chronicles, Volume 1, 1980 to 1989, A Flyer Oral History. It's been out for a little while now. If you're a patron, the book is free. You probably already know that. Also, if you're watching this and you're a patron and you want an incendiary device patch, just send me an, just send me an address and, and we'll send you one uh, right away. So that's happening. You do want this ID patch. They are cool. Um, there's also a PayPal address. Please support the show. Show needs your support. The show has gotten a lot of support, but you know, 
Speaking of books, how's the new one coming along? It's come. We're doing the second volume. Thanks for asking, Lenny. Uh, the second volume, the New York Hardcore Chronicles, volume two, 1991, uh, 1990, excuse me, to 1999. Um, working on it now. Working on it now. It's great. And uh, a lot of people uh, contributing to it uh, the next 10 years. So, you know, these things take time, uh, but it's happening. Every day I try to follow up on something, you know, uh, as far as the book goes. So, yeah, the boxing show was great. We got to do that again. Boxing show. I love when we do. I love when we do stuff like that. Boxing show, you know, shit like that. You know, I want to mention, here's a show. Um, I announced it on social media the other day. Um, but let's talk about it here for a second. On Wednesday, August 10th, we have um, Mike Pooch from Sworn Enemy and Chris Rafalowicz from uh, Shattered Realm. Uh, they have a, a new band together called See Through You, and they have a release out called Hollowed Out. And we're gonna we're gonna have them on. We're gonna talk about uh, what's going on and uh, this new project that they have. This new, you know, pretty killer project. Hard, hard. So yeah, we're gonna mix it up with Mike and Chris. See Through You, uh, their new release. It's on Upstate Records. We're gonna. You, you know who else we're talking to? And I guess I could. I guess I could say it. it, it it's. It's it's all right to uh, to mention it. Uh, is Angelo from Fishbone? We got, we're going to try to get Angelo from Fishbone on the show. I want to mention that on Sunday, July twenty fourth, the next Back to the New York Hardcore Roots series show at the Bowery Electric. It's free. It's all ages. Bring the wife and kids. Support. Um, it is Scott Dottino's birthday bash with Sub Zero, Kings Never Die. Brick by Brick, Upstate Represent, Dead Crew and Mad Mulligans. If it's free, it is truly for me. Sunday, July 24th. Get your ass down there. Show some, some support, you friggin' bum. And, um, oh, yeah, you know what? Why don't we, this, this, this show has been rejiggered. Speaking of Len, Lenny and, uh, and Crazy Eddie, uh, that, down at uh, Bowery Electric on Sunday, September 11th. Um, Winter Wolf, Orlando Furioso, Murderer's Row, Upstate New York represent, Crazy Eddie, and Old School Philly Legends, Why Die? We'll be down at Bowery Electric. Of course, it is free, and it is all ages, uh, so come on down. Um, I think I covered this. I covered that. Let's bring our, uh, our guests back on. Let me make sure everybody's okay. Yeah, the AC is really working now at the Bowery Electric. Yep. Uh, I saw five Biohazard open for Fishbone at City Gardens in 94. Yeah, that was a that was a crazy tour. Yeah, that was, that was a good tour. Um, what happened with Castle Heights? You know, uh, Scandato made me change the date um, once, and then he wanted me to change it a second time. And I said, bro, that's it. If you ever want to do it and you're serious, let me know. I don't think he really wanted to come on and do the show. So uh, there's, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, so the, the, the Castle Heights thing just sort of flitted away. It happens sometimes. It happens, as you know. Um, let's bring our guests back on. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, Mr. Johnny Rio. Hey, man. What's happening? And let's bring the one, the only, Sid the Kid on. What's up, Sid? Uh-oh. There he is. Oh. Johnny Cakes, what's going on, brother? What's up, Sid? How are you, bud? Oh, hanging didn't in you there. Guys, hey, in didn't there. you guys just, uh, Sid, didn't you guys just cross paths in Europe? For one show. For just one. Yeah. Was, was that yeah. the take? The, what was that? Yeah. The, take, the take and slap shot were on a show together? It was, it was our last date of the tour in Dortmund. It was their fifth date. So they were just, they were just I got up for that. I got internationally mamalooked by Sid the Kid. <laughs> but I, love it. Love I have it. fond memories. I have fond memories of Dortmund, Germany. I actually was considering moving there at one point. You know? Oh. Uh, I didn't <laughs> want to leave Europe in general, Drew. Yeah. Just leave me there. Shit. Dortmund, I, I had really fond memories of Dortmund. They have like a, a park that's like Central Park. Um uh, I was there with, with with my wife at the time. Uh uh they won the soccer championship and it was really exciting. 
You know, it, it, it was a really, and, and the record company was based there. Century Media was based in, in, in Dortmund. And at the time I was managing Marauders, Sub-Zero, Fury of Five, and they were all signed to that label. It was, it was a nice, it was, it was a nice time, man. Is that right, Sid? Oh, yeah. Are you wearing your own t-shirt? Yeah, because I can. Is that right? Because I can. <laughs> damn, damn, you're corny, Sid. All right. All right, let's do it. Let's do uh, Album of the Week. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, here it is, album of the week. Bang! There it is. Boom! Right. Oh, snap! Look at that. Right. Classic. That's a classic right there. How about a curveball? All right, Sid. None of you uh, motherfuckers saw it coming. So, ladies and gentlemen, for those who don't know, this is a Stone Rose's debut album. Uh, if you don't know who this band is, you know, obviously they're from Manchester, England. Uh, I believe they recorded this in the winter of 88 and then coming out in May uh, 2nd of 1989. Uh, you know, really, I uh, believe this is recorded at Battery Studios in London, England with producer John Le Leckie. Uh, if I pronounce that, if I mispronounce it, let me know. Um, basically, you know, this album was the building block for the fundamental fundamentals of the, the Manchester Junior which basically was a precursor to Britpop in you know the early 90s with bands like Oasis and so on and so forth. You know, it took up to I believe um quite a few years for this album to go platinum. And um you know it, it sold over a million copies easily just in America and uh, the UK alone. You know, this you know and I believe when it did actually re-enter the charts, uh, UK charts it got positioned at number 9. Um you know, there's a lot to say about this album, even, you know, going as far as say, uh, you know, Monthly Q magazine was amongst like 100 most beautiful covers of all time. It's like definitely something when you see, you know, this kind of an album, you don't know what to think of it. Because, of course, when, you know, us being at a younger age, we just saw the cover. You know, you were interested. You didn't care what it sounded like at first. You just, oh, shit. You know, you take it home, listen to it. And, you know, before you two or the internet, you don't know if it was good or for it sucked. You just kind of went on a whim to check out this band, you know, that kind of a thing. Yeah. Uh, Johnny, is this a record that uh, resonated for you? Yeah, I love, I got a, I have one of my favorite records, really. I, I think Vibe Wise or whatever, it's like, um, um, I, I always give the young kids at the barbershop a hard time about like, cause every, you know, and giving somebody a nice shave or whatever really kind of quiet mood or whatever and it'll be like some beat down band playing and the, you know what i mean and it's like yeah. so are you the kind of guy that loves hardcore so much that when you're taking your girl out for you know you're trying to romance your lady or whatever you're trying to do you're not gonna you're not gonna put on some good music this is one of those records for me it's kind of always been a nice way to you know when you when you need a a break you know when i was younger this record got a lot of spins for me yeah i i don't i i i, I know the band i i don't know i i i peripherally uh, you know uh, know this record i did some listening to it today as i was getting ready and uh it's it certainly uh brought me back you know uh to, to that that I, uh yeah you know sid you might know this you might know this more than me since it's you've obviously been doing a lot of research on it, like, which is uh, good job on that shit, man. But the, the, the thing I love about this record is there's so many hits on there, but I feel like they did, they threw a curveball like track four, right? Like it's like a, uh, like a lot of bands will do the experimental shit, like as a hidden track or at the end of the record or whatever. But I think like track four is just track three in reverse. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. there's some kind right? of, there's some kind I of weird, it was, yeah, but it's I like, believe, I believe it was Don't Stop if that was the track I'm thinking of. And honestly, people who are like, you know, quote me if I'm wrong on this, but just, you know, simply with the production alone, because John Leckie did actually have a hand, you know, even uh, worked on Pink Floyd's uh, The Metal Record, The Metal Record, and Peter Hook also produced this album as well. So, you know, definitely for a debut album for this kind of a band, this kind of a style that preceded Britpop really does speak to, you know, the generation coming after, you know, with, even Oasis, you know, when they came out, that was their thing. But for a band like Stone Roses, it was something different at the time that no one really saw coming 
until it got so popular that it that it went, you know, freaking platinum, you know. So yeah, make make makes makes sense. Um, the, uh, Robert Robert Hogg says the musicianship on this album is unreal. Um, Johnny, do you agree that that? Uh, uh, the, uh, Robert says the musicianship on this album is unreal. Johnny, do you agree? Uh, Maney, am I pronouncing that right? Is one of the best player, best players, best best bass players out there. Let's see, are we gonna have another Cra a Craig ahead difficulty here? Oh, please don't tell me this. Now. Yeah, it could be. Let me, Oof. Get rid of all, let me get rid of all this stuff. Hold on. Oof. Technical difficulties there. Relax. Hold on. I know. I he'll, know. he'll be back. He'll be back. They, they always he'll, do. They they'll always be do. back. They always do. In the meantime, um, hey, are you, in the meantime, are you, you are DJing, here's another show that's coming up that you are DJing, right? The Run Amok Fest? Yeah, I'm actually going to be uh, doing double duty at that show. Oh, that's right. How did that, how did I let that happen? Well, true. You know, you're such a busy guy. I mean, how did I let that happen? That you're playing and DJing the same thing? Yeah. Hey, All right. it's Sunday. It's Sunday, Sunday, August fourteenth. It is the Run Amok Fest upstairs and downstairs at the Bowery Electric with RBNX, United Blood, Necrotic Society, Damn Your Eyes, The Carbon Parade, Enrage, and Leeway. It is the Run Amok Fest. Sunday, August 14th. And my drummer's doing double duty at that show, too. He's playing in two bands. Oh, that's right. Let's see if see, Drew, so it, 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 You with us, Johnny? Yeah, I'm, I got you. I don't know what happened there, but yeah, I'm back. I think, I, think we know, I think we know at this point, whenever you go sideways, sign off and sign back on, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, uh, from Robert Hogg, a our, our, our real great supporter of the show in Scotland who loves this Hell band. Yeah says the musicianship on this album is unreal johnny do you agree M M manny am i pronouncing that right manny is, is yeah. one of the best bass players out there definitely i think he holds that i think he holds that whole operation together i still to this day when you know if we're sound checking or line checking or whatever i'll i'll do do that i want to be a bass bass line cool but uh all right well, Sid, well done. It's a classic, it's a classic non-punk rock and a classic non-punk and hardcore record, Sid. That was a good choice. Yeah, because I mean, look, sometimes, and, and I know some people will be commenting, oh, and I'm not going to name who because I can see who's commenting. You know, none of us are going to like everything. You know, we're not going to like punk rock. Some of us won't like hardcore. Some of us won't like the hipster shit that some people like. But you know what? Once in a blue moon, you have to dip your toe into the pool Oh shit! Put that, that, that thing away. <laughs> Jeez, you know, you know, you know, um, you, know right what, you know, reminded me. Uh, <laughs> I, I forgot. I was out. I was out on the road in Europe. I might have been with Biohazard. Uh, might have been in the early '90s, and we were in. I think we might have been in Manchester. The promoter uh, asked us. Uh, we had a day off. We went and saw the Charlatans UK uh, over there. Oh, and nice! When, when they were really popping and. I tell you, I was blown away. It's when that whole scene was really, really like we. It was right when it was really popping, and uh, we went to the show. And I didn't know much about what was going on, but uh, at the, but seeing them live, I was really caught up, and they were really great. It really, really, really great. Ah, yeah. I love that city too. I love Manchester, yeah. and I yeah. love the whole the whole flavor. That's a, such a good musical city. So many good bands come out out of that. Come out of there. I mean, I, I assume, Johnny, you've been over there tour managing, playing so many times that there's, there's, there's probably a handful of places that you like know like the back of your hand at this point. You have friends there and everything. When you see that on the itinerary, you're like, oh, wow, great. I can't wait to get back there, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, Our, it's, it's a beautiful part of this whole thing. For sure. I, hey, Sid, well done, man. Anybody you want to shout out? Nah, you know, just everyone just tune it in, have fun. Like it is Sunday, it's a fun day. We're all here to have fun, guys. And yes, Lenny, even I like to have fun. All right, Sid, I'll talk to you later. Well done, thank you. Cheers, guys. Later, Sid.
Right. Sid, Sid, the, Sid the kid bringing it, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, I want to talk about, uh, and we might be, I know we might be, we might be skipping a little bit, but, uh, you know, here's a fan favorite on the show. It is, it is, you know, New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Tell us about uh, your, your tenure with Roger Moret and the disasters and how that came about. Um, well, I was, I was with the Boston's at this point, but see Roger, I would, I, I don't think I'm speaking out of school when I say like, You froze up. You know, uh, hey, John, you, you, are you there? Yeah, you, 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 yeah. Kind of, you froze up on me. Um, oh, sorry about that. Let's try, uh, let's yeah, try, so try again. Try again. Start again. No worries. Yeah, yeah so, uh, Agnostic Front's always been like they were probably the biggest supporters of the Bruisers uh, going back to forever ago. You know what I mean? And and Madball as well. Madball took took the band on the on the very first European tour when like really there were probably uh, I don't know twenty more appropriate bands or whatever. So it's just all of the New York hardcore always supported the Bruisers coming up, and to me that always that was just part of um that's just kind of always been ingrained in me so i've always and i always really appreciated rogers uh the, like the big quote i think is never trust a hardcore kid who doesn't listen to punk rock or something like that but yeah. roger had this very uh all-inclusive way of sort of making you feel like family um and we stayed in touch over over time and i think i don't I know. I know he thought of me specifically uh, in doing the, in doing that project. If I'm thinking back to it correctly, and we had Matt Kelly from Dropkicks was playing drums initially, um, and then the Reese. Was it, was that the original lineup? Uh, yeah, the original lineup was uh, me and Roger and. I'll never forget meeting Reese who worked at 99 X. He was fresh off the plane from New Zealand and he worked 99 X. And I remember getting in Rogers old Mercury, his 1950 Merc. And I think it was a 50 Merc. Yeah. And uh, so we go down there to 99 X and uh, he's like, you're going to meet our new guitar player. And he was just fresh face. He was just a big fan of New York hardcore and, and, moved to New York and uh, from New Zealand as a kid and, or as a young adult. And uh, so for him, like being in a band with Roger was like the greatest honor ever. Coincidentally, I'm now all these years later, he's in my other, my new band, True Intentions is the, I have the band with him. So, but going back to that. So anyway, we meet Reese and, uh, and Matt Kelly was going to be the first drummer from Dropkick and, uh, and do the record and stuff. And then, I don't, I don't know how I guess uh, Roger had met Johnny Cray because obviously uh, Roger really wanted to do a lot with the disasters more than certainly than Matt Kelly could do. And ultimately more than I could do even. And, uh, but it, Roger really worked that record hard and uh, yeah, were, but it was, were you, were you involved with the production of this one or was that the next one? Uh, it was not not the next one. Well, we all really had a lot to do with that first one. We really all contributed a lot to it because you got to remember also at that time, Roger was finding his voice as a punk rock singer. Yeah. So we were all in there like kind of, should we, should he really sing it like Roger from AF or should he, right. you know, kind of put a different spin on it, a different style into it. Um, so we, we really helped him sort of encourage or encourage him and what we thought was cool. And luckily, you know, Roger's kind of guy who's going to do what he thinks is cool anyways. But luckily he was like, yeah, I see what you guys are coming from. And man, we all just kind of worked together on that first one. And then, uh, we recorded at the outpost in Stoughton and, uh, shit, man, that Jim Siegel at the outpost, he, back in those days, he didn't put out a bad sound and record. So yeah. uh, we were in good hands. You know, uh, in doing my homework for the show, I listened to a lot of, of the disasters. And, uh, 
you know, there, there's, uh, you know, at the time I, I wasn't in New York at the time. I was a little bit out of the mix. So doing my homework, it's some really great work you guys did there. Some really good stuff. And I'm, I'm super proud of it. I, I only wish that I could have, I, I only wish I could have sort of toured with it more. I really love, yeah. I love touring with Roger and I love Reese and uh, Johnny Cray was great too. And, you know, we love Johnny Cray, man. He's uh, that guy's been in more. Ba I don't know of anyone that's been in more bands than Johnny Cray. Yeah, I mean, yeah. demise. You know, uh, you know, bastard clan, the craze, drunken rampage. Yeah, you know, Roger Barrett, the disasters. It just uh, oh, he's playing this next Bowery Electric show we're doing. He plays with the Mad Mulligans. You know, he's, yeah. He's I mean, Johnny Cray was real deal too. Like he had no knowledge or any interest or any real desire to be a, a higher profile sort of right. punk band, any yeah. of the other bands that were on Hellcat and stuff, Johnny was like, ah, whatever. Like he was yeah, just yeah. sort of like, uh, he was real deal. And, uh, but he didn't even have real, uh, real knowledge about it even, you know what I mean? Some guys are like, yeah, that's not my thing, but they still know about it. Johnny was just so punk rock that he was just completely <laughs> removed from anything that was, uh, a wider audience or whatever you know what i mean yeah yeah i do he's there's there's a bunch of guys like that in new york <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah you know we, we, we i we, love we, it we got, yeah yeah we got a bunch we got a bunch of those guys um you know uh just just you, you know t tell i i don't have a photo but I, I find one of the an interesting project that you were involved in is murder the stout which was yeah. a, a bit of a, a folk project uh, along with the Street Dogs guitar player, T tell us a little bit about that. That's a, that's a little bit different, and that and that sort of leads, in a way, is it safe to say that that kind of leads into your your cow your cow boy, uh, yeah. sort of oi thing, Reckon. right? Is, is, right. Yeah. I mean, it's just sort of a segue there, right? Yeah, a little. Well, like I said, even going back to the Bruiser days, I always had a real interest in like Americana music and yeah. you know alt country and old school kind of stuff and acoustic music and folk mu street dogs. We, we always had an element of folk music in there too. And, um, pro I always loved protest music and any, anything like that. And, uh, and so, yeah, uh, the, also in street dogs, we really made a conscious effort not to be an Irish band per se. Like it was like, uh, you know, if, if Mike wrote something that was maybe a little bit more in that direction, we would do. But we always try to not try to be Dropkick Murphys Junior sure. or something. We just try to do our own that thing. Makes but sense. so yeah. the uh, I met I met this guy in in Houston, the Scottish guy named Hugh Morrison, and he uh, he's a really sort of talented accordion player and lyricist, and he was in like you know Robbie Burns poetry and just some interesting stuff and. I was producing his music and then I was like, man, it would be fun to kind of mix some, some of the guys that at the time I had a studio at home. So I had a lot of the street dog guys, like all, all I did was street dogs and studio work. And so I had a lot of the guys uh, from the band around a lot. And we just had, we were making tons of music back then. And uh, man, so we mixed, we started doing murder the stout stuff, which is more kind of Celtic. And then we did, FM 359, which is like, um, you know, it's more, uh, uh, there's some Americana in there as well as and Rick, Rick Barton, a couple Rick of Barton sort of, was in, Rick Barton was in yeah. that project, right? Yeah. 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 And, uh, and Hugh still had, Hugh Morrison still has murder the stout going now too, and my friend Neil as well. Um, but yeah, I just tried to, I, I really wanted to, uh, when I, I produced a street dogs record and we did it at the outpost or, uh, 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 God, what the hell do you call it? Out in Fort Collins, the blasting room. Um, ah. uh, we did a record out there and you know, those guys are so talented. The Livermore, Jason Livermore as an engineer and stuff like that. And I was producing it. Bill Stevenson was out sick and he showed me kind of all these microphones that you could run a B room studio out of. <laughs> and, they were all relatively affordable and all that. And I put the studio together at my house out of stuff that I had learned from the blasting room and really just wanted to make tons of different kind of music. Were you, were you in Texas at the time? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, and that, it, it, I mean, th there is a lineage. Tell us about this project. So uh, that was kind which, of which, by the way, I, I was I, which, by the way, I, I was listening to and, and poking around, and it, it's great. It, it's you doing acoustic, you know, playing solo acoustic, right? This is a solo acoustic yeah. project, right? Well, yeah, there's some, there's, it's kind of country rockabilly because there's lead guitar and wow. upright bass and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Jeff from the Bruisers plays lead guitar in it, uh, wow. Pete Sosa plays drums and, uh, yeah, and, and I'm, I'm doing acoustic and singing. I do the upright tracks and stuff, but, uh, yeah, we, uh, honestly, I, I met my brother, Big Truth out in Europe. He was, for some reason, he was out traveling with Blood for Blood and our paths crossed and like munich and we were it was alcohol probably fueled and we and i i don't know how it came up but we started talking about how and it was like drunk talk stuff it wasn't even serious i think at that time street dogs had just done a tour and one of the guys on the tour was this guy ski king and he was a dj that played like at street punk shows and and punk rock hardcore shows and he would play like johnny cash songs in the middle and all the European or the German kids anyway, were like, wow, oh, this is awesome. Like they were loving it. So me and truth, we're talking just, to, wouldn't it be funny to do this cowboy thing? He came up with like the, the boots and this and that. And he, you know, or we were on that tour. We just, it came up as something funny. So a couple weeks later, I was talking to my other friend at a uh, festival in the UK and uh, Diane from Randallay was there. And I was like, yeah, wouldn't it be funny to blah, blah, blah with the, Oi songs and doing because really, Oi songs are just working class songs. Country songs are just working Absolutely. class songs. I thought it would just Absolutely. be a, a a cool little thing to do or whatever. And Diane, like I thought, and, she and, was going to be and, like, and, and it all kind of it, it it all kind of all roads lead back to Woody Guthrie, you know? Yeah, in a certain yeah, that's way, right. you know? Yeah, that's right. So go on. Go on. <laughs> I mean, and and it like I said, it was just like crazy drunk talk stuff or whatever. And I had mentioned in front of Diane from Randallay and she from Randallay records out there. And she was just, uh, she goes, yeah, I'll pay for that. And I was like, okay, like, yeah. why not? Yeah. I had the, I had the studio at home and, uh, and I just thought it'd be fun to do. And I really got, I really got into it. I know it's, it's, I'll play it for some people. My brother Rico, or, you know, Rico, he, Rico will spin it out in Kansas city a lot. And I'll get like whenever he plays it at his DJ nights, I'll get like some emails about it. Like I heard your thing, and about you know, it's nice. really cool, like it's unique or whatever. You know, you know, something something can be said, and I can relate to it. Um, you know, I, I've done it myself. I played solo acoustic. I had the Drew Stone Hit Squad. It's 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 something can be said for uh, you know just picking up the acoustic and sort of banging it out. I, I really yeah. I, I've been actually playing a lot of guitar lately, and I'm thinking. I was just talking to my gal this morning and she's like, you should just bring the guitar to the next show and just, you know, just get up there and play first, you know, like, yeah, yeah. And, and like, I, I just might do it. You know, I mean, I, I've yeah. been playing a lot, playing a lot of acoustic lately. So it's, it's enjoyable. I, I, I like it. I always have, you know? Yeah. It's fun to do. I mean, you can, yeah. you know, absolutely. You hey, can convey so much with it. Yeah. You know, you know, and I've mentioned this on the show when I was on the misfits, 1997 European tour when I was managing Sub Zero, I was out there and on, on a dare. So, because th there was always an acoustic backstage, someone dared me to um, uh, go up and, and sort of open the show and do some acoustic songs. And I took them up on it and um, I, went, I went and did it. And I think it was in Italy or Germany. And wouldn't you know it, it went over really well. And I, no started, I started doing it. Um, on this tour, I got I got a couple. Let me find a photo. Um, let me see. I got to have one somewhere. Hold on. You know, and uh, let me see. Oh, God, this brings back some memories, right? Um, oh, I remember crossing. Yeah, go ahead. I remember crossing paths with that tour. Not to backtrack, but I remember uh, in the Bruiser days we crossed paths with that Misfits Sub-Zero tour in Leipzig, I want to say. 
and we and and we went and i remember uh we still i still have a picture of a few of us with jerry only in the back of the in the back of that bus yeah. <laughs> it was it was it was a really fun tour here's a shot I, I, i'm in front with the 12 string but here's me with the misfits yeah. at the time and uh <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in front with the 12 string you know and it, it was it was a really and they were great on that tour. That was like oh, that's yeah. the first tour they did with Michael Graves, you know. Yeah. And it, it was their first ever European tour. And no so kidding. people, yeah, it was their first ever European tour. And people were coming out in droves. The shows were huge. And, and yeah. I started going out and playing acoustic. And, you know, I got to say, like, listen, you got to have balls. I still have that poster. I have yeah. that poster actually now that right I think on. about it. Yeah. You gotta yeah. have balls, man. You know, you got you yeah. know, in this life, you gotta have balls. And what's the point? Yeah, you, you do. Know? Yeah. You do. So well, I mean, what a weird, what a weird time to debut an acoustic project, though. That's a that's a hell of a bill to do that on. <laughs> it was on a dare, like I dare you. And I went oh, out yeah. and it was like that takes some stack, man. It was in Italy. And like, you know what? And I came out and I did like a bunch of, you know, a little of this, a little of that, threw in a Dylan song, you know, did some Woody Guthrie, so, uh, you know, did some punk rock shit, and uh, they loved it. And then yeah. I, I think I did it like four or five, and then Michael Graves started coming out and singing with me. He, here's, but he, here's, a, here's a, another shot from that tour. Here's, uh, this is backstage from that tour, but that's Michael, that's Michael Alago, uh, who I ended up directing the oh, film yeah. about his life. That's really where yeah. I connected with Michael Alago, because Michael Alago signed the Misfits to Geffen, and that was the tour that they were out supporting. Uh, the, the, that, 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 uh, and there's Jerry only in the back there, blow drying his leather, you know, belt. Yeah, you yeah. Know, for the, that's for the, funny. Yeah, yeah, American yeah. Psycho. That was for that record, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was that was produced by Daniel Ray, you know, who, yeah. who, who did all the Ramon stuff. It's a great record. I, I, I love that record. Great record, great record. Yeah, yeah. Hey, let's talk about let's play this clip. Uh, this True Intentions clip, uh, which is uh, where a lot of your energy is focused these days. Let's take a peek at this for a minute or two. We have two intentions from Texas. Come on, it's a blessing to be here. Let's go. This kid can belt it out, bro. Oh man! This, oh, this, dude! This this this, 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 this kid's a heavyweight. He can belt it out, huh? Yeah, yeah. He's uh, he's like a, a super old school uh, Houston, Texas hardcore guy. Like, is that right? Old, like, <laughs> yeah. He, he, uh, he's great band, Will to Live, that he's had forever, and. Uh, yeah, really helped put kind of Houston hardcore on the map. And he's a great guy, too. He's a sweetheart of a guy. Let's hear a little more. But yeah, man, he's, he's got... Is that your go-to bass there? Yeah, yeah. What's that? A, what's that? A, 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 a jazz or is that a precision? It's a it's a P bass, seventy-seven. Yeah, P. Oh, wow. I've tried. Like the the uh, the airline has lost it for a week at one point. Like uh, <laughs> I, I've tried, I tried to uh, I tried to tour without it, 
and just nothing is as great as that bass is. So now I, I, I just have a gig bag and I, if I can't, if I can't take it on the plane with me, I'm staying wherever I am, you know, like, uh, that's the great, that's the great fear, isn't it? Like, you know, even the guitar player in my band, it's like, you know, if you, if I can't carry it on the plane, I don't want to go, man. Yeah. You know? It's in the hotel room with me every night. It's yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. I don't Yeah. Tell us a little bit about uh, true intentions. How did it come together and, and, and what are your hopes for it? Well, uh, it came together during the pandemic. Uh, Reese, who obviously we did the disasters together, and um, I, he was also involved in this project I, I produced and started um, called Liberty and Justice out here uh, in, in Houston. I'm not in it anymore, but I still, I still work with the guys and everything. But um, and Reese isn't in it anymore either, but we, we, so we started working together on that. But man, Reese has been in the Houston area for years too, but he's even more of a hermit than me. So we never really, so we're like, man, the only way for us to hang out is to play music together. So during the pandemic, we just kind of started batting songs back and forth. And, uh, when we were looking for, um, we were, we, so we started this project and then we started an, another project called honor culture uh you know with, with monster and big truth and ak oh. ray and and hopefully that's going to go on as well but we started these two projects that we were writing with and when we did the true intention stuff we were looking for singers and uh this guy you know we wanted to be melodic we not straight up old school hardcore we wanted to have some sort of melody to it like there's a couple of songs on there that get a little bit um, you know, we just wanted to be a, a, a little bit more of an old school, but maybe sl some slight melody at, at spots and just try to do something different or whatever. And this guy, Rob, um, who really is raised on metal and, um, and, you know, if you heard Will to Live, it's like a kind of hate breed -ish in, in that kind of vein. You know what I mean? It's not at all like we turn attention to hear a lot of the punk rock influences um but the cool sort of mismatch with it is that you drummer and and rob will the live or more on the side of things me and reese come out of hardcore but we also come heavy on the punk rock side of things and um it's just sort of a cool little mix up of that and the record came out awesome you can hear it on spotify and all that stuff now and uh, probably apple music or all that kind of crap but um it will be coming out on static era soon vinyl and you know, worldwide and all that kind of stuff. And Point of Origin is the True Intentions recording, right? Yeah. 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 That's really, I, like, I'm super proud of that. That EP really came out. Like, I, I really enjoy listening to it. So recorded, I'm, I'm super recorded, stoked on it. Recorded it in your, at your place, in your studio? Not in my place, no. We recorded it with this guy, Craig Douglas, here in, in Houston. And, uh, yeah. That we all kind of worked together and all had a hand in making it, mixing it, sort of. But Craig did know, a great know, job on. I know you said you're a hermit, but the, uh, uh, I mean, of course, and the fact that you have five kids, right? That, yeah. that keeps you that keeps you a little busy. But is is there? I I mean, I know at one point Houston had a pretty vibrant scene. Is is there is there still a a, a lot happening in Houston as far as clubs or gigs or is 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 they is, do. It, it is vibrant and it's super youth orientated, which is really yeah. great to see. Uh, I yeah. know just in playing shows with true intentions, like the, the crowds are way like just way more diverse than they were when, when we were kids, you know what I mean? And, and more hardcore is a lot more kind of inclusive now. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, I don't know. It's cool to see what kids are doing with it. And, but at the same time, there's a, there's still a kind of strong nod at the tradition and the roots of, of, of it all. And, and I appreciate that, of course. So is, is true intentions a band? Have you gotten outside the area? Have you, I mean, I know it's, I know it's hard, man, you know, you, like, know, we were, you know, for a project like this, but have you gotten out of town? Are you looking to get out of town? Honestly, we were hoping we, we don't really have the release schedule for it yet or, or when um, Jay's or, or the Static Era guys are looking to kind of put it out. But we're sort of um, 
our hope was really to put it out and then kind of do some stuff to support it. But at this point we did, uh, when Slapshot did the 35th reunion show or, uh, or 35th anniversary show, uh, right. last year we did, uh, Boston. That's where that clip was from. Yeah. I, um, I, I figured that out. Yeah. If you, and, uh, uh, but other than that, no, just kind of playing Texas right now. Listen, if you ever make it up to New York and want to do one of one of these Bowery Electric shows, we'd love to have you, man. You know, oh, we'd love to do it. Yeah. Love fun. to do it. And it's like you talked about. You know, they're they're really fun all ages shows. You know, it's like it's all ages. It's free. There's no. It's a Sunday afternoon. There's no fucking excuses. You know what I mean? It's right. like what else? What else do you need me to fucking do? Set up in your living room? You know? It's like I'm doing free all ages matinees a block away from CBGBs. Come on. You right. Know? <laughs> you know, the thing I love about this band or even just doing a band like this is that you're not concerned about really anything other than getting together with your with your buddies and having a good yeah. time playing music that you're stoked on or whatever. But like you're not thinking about I wonder how many T-shirts we sold tonight or, you yeah, know, yeah. or, you know, like, oh, 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 shit, we're getting paid something. That's kind of cool. You get a, yeah. I'm happy to get a coffee, you know, like, yeah, yeah. For, for sure. Hey, let me take my last sponsor break. Let me shout out a couple sponsors and we'll come back and let's take some questions from around the world, all right? Right on. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live and our guest today is Johnny Rio from True Intentions, Street Dogs, The Bruisers. Just got off tour with Slapshot. Tour manager, producer, a lot to talk about here. So uh, conjure up your questions. Uh, please put them in the uh, chat room. Let's, do, let's, let's have some fun with some questions. And uh, we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Chacho's Tacos, Generation Records, 126 Hardcore Clothing, and Grunge and Grime Soap Company. They're a handmade soap and skincare company with a rock and roll spirit. Based in Nashville, Tennessee, they combine their love for rock music and their love for creating products that are good for your skin and good for your soul. Since 2019, they've been creating high-quality, natural, handmade soaps and skincare products with ethically sourced and sustainable ingredients. Inspired by the music of the 80s and 90s, from hair metal to grunge and everything in between, they give 10% of their net proceeds to local and community outreach programs. Visit their website at www.grungeandgrime.com and enter the code DREW to get 20% on your first order. Also, Last but not least, the one, the only, Chacho's Tacos. Chacho's Tacos, located in Corpus Christi, Chacho's Tacos, opened their doors in 2001, home of the almighty Chacho's Taco. They cook up an incredible home-style Tex-Mex food, and this month they're celebrating their 20th anniversary. They've been supporting underground music since the beginning, and in their own words, we ain't stopping anytime soon. Touring bands that play Corpus Christi, swing by, get a home-cooked meal at Chacho's Tacos, we got you. The underground scene will never die. Please follow us on Facebook and on Instagram. Uh, also want to mention upcoming show. Uh, you asked for it. You got it. Uh, this is something that came up recently. People were saying, yo, get Jerry A. from Poison Idea on the show. Well, you know what? We made it happen. Coming up on Sunday, August 28th, Jerry A. will be on the show from Poison Idea. Looking forward to that. Um, I've been going back and forth with him a bit. Uh, this should be a good one. I know there's a lot of Poison Idea uh, fans out there that love this band. So looking forward to having Jerry A. on the show. Also want to mention, you know what, I'm, I'm going to throw this out there. Uh, it's It's been asked a couple of times. Uh, if you're home, you're looking for something to watch. Um, I have four films right now that are on Amazon Prime and, and Hulu and all that. Uh, all ages, XXX, all ages, XXX, the Boston hardcore film is on Amazon. The New York hardcore Chronicles film, uh, the New York hardcore Chronicles 1.5. And who the F is that guy? The fabulous journey of Michael Lago, uh, four films that I directed, uh, are out there right now. So, um, don't be shy. If you're looking, I know I'm probably preaching to the converted here and, um, you know, a lot of people out there, you know, some of these have been out for a minute. But uh, if you've yet to see uh, any of these, kick back, crack open a cold one. Uh, I recommend any of them. 
they're all they're all my children you know and uh, my new film uh, will probably be on streaming um, in a little bit. One last self-indulgent shout out on Sunday, October 9th. We, as in incendiary device, we're going to be playing the Crash Fest in Portland, Oregon at the Bossa Nova Ballroom. We're playing the same night as The Take and as Fang, our friends. So if you're out, in the Portland, Oregon area. Heads up, we're coming out. We played last year. It was great. Uh, we're looking forward to playing Sunday, October 9th. Uh, this year, Boston Nova Ballroom, Portland, Ora, Oregon, Origami. That said, um, uh, any questions, uh, post up. Post up, post up. Questions, let's get crazy. Let's bring our guests back on. Um, Mr. Johnny Rio. Hey, man. Yo. Hey, let me, uh, let me see what we got here. Yes. Yeah, so, um, Gary says, if you liked early hate breed circa perseverance era, you'll love will to live. Yeah. Yeah. Right. For sure. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Um, what else we got here? Let's go with some questions. What, do, what are you guys doing? Um, how can the public get a hold of Johnny? Uh, yeah, here. Here's um, – there you go. There's his Instagram right there. Reach out to him on Instagram. You know, probably the best, probably the best way. You know, you know, we, you know what we haven't, we haven't touched on, which, which we, we need to um, – Oh, Lori, Lori Dawn, uh, Women of the Pit represents, says, love cowboy, really fun. Thank you. Thank you. See, chicks dig it, right? <laughs> hey, man, just so long as pe people don't, you know, there, there's like a certain element. It's like a certain element of fun and humor, but yeah. a certain element of like giving homage to, to the songs as well, you know? Yeah, absolutely. But it was, it was fun to do. Our friend Bunny asks, What's it like to play with Mike Ness? It was uh, it was intimidating, honestly. You know, yeah. Um, uh -huh. He especially at that time, like uh, I'll never forget. If you played something that he didn't that he didn't like, he would he would you know because he's up on the front of the stage or whatever. He would just kind of uh, look back and like give a this death stare. You know what I mean? You're like, oh fuck, like. <laughs> The look that'll cut right through you, you know what I mean? But he, he was intimidating because, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, he, he wrote some great songs and stuff like that. When I, yeah, all I wanted to do was, was do a good job. So it's like, you know, it was intimidating for sure. Uh, Darren asks, uh, what would you rather play, Johnny, uh, clubs or festivals? Good question. That is, a, I, I think a, like a pack, a, probably a packed out 500 cap room is a, a hot, sweaty energy and singing along and that kind of thing is probably my, my favorite. But there used to be the Gros Rock Festival in Belgium. And sure, I remember it. Yeah. that was insane. And, and I don't know what it was about the energy of that festival, but. I had some of the most fun shows of my life playing that that festival for sure. It, it's like it's like two different animals, man. You know, it's like a lot of times, you know, these festivals, they're you know, on the big stage, it's so intense. It all happens so fast. You know, it's like, ah, you know, yeah, yeah, and for then, sure. You know, you know, God, I just remember some of those big and those big festival stages, man. You feel yeah. really, you feel really awkward. I mean, I mean, I'll keep it in your eye. Really feel awkward and 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 vulnerable. You're like on this huge stage, and yeah, there's a lot of bands out there like Agnostic Front, like Sick of It All, that know how to pl that that have have really fine tuned their their uh, you know their 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 act on the big stage. Yeah. You know, like Sick of It All. It's like an it's like a fucking aerobics uh, fucking uh, exercise you know like oh yeah those guys running still, around. still 
Yeah. Like, yeah, like, and it still sounds like uh, sick of it all are incredible like that. Just this. Yeah. yeah. They I mean, keep you, that, you, you they got, keep the energy at the same, you know, there's never any kind of fall, fall off at all. Like, and, and didn't you guys, you guys just played some, some festivals on the slap shot run, right? Yeah. Yeah. We did Hellfest. fest. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was, it was cool. It must, it, be was fun cool. to, it must be fun for you to do something like Hellfest because just from working in the business, you just, you must see, it's like a, it's like a, a, a it's like a reunion, a get together, right? Right. Yeah, 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 for sure. Those, that's kind of the best part of those festivals is just yeah, seeing right. so many, you know, friends. And and all that a lot of stuff. times the food is good too. <laughs> yeah. This time though, it was like 120 degrees. I was, oh. it was great. It was oppressive. But it was, but it was, it was, it was so much fun getting back out there for sure. Here's one from uh, Tony Gerald. Uh, Gerald, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, uh, Tony. I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you, Johnny, for all the great years going to all the street dog shows. My wife and I would tour around, almost like following the Grateful Dead. Uh, great times. Thank you for all the good times. That's nice. That's awesome. Oh yeah, Tony. I remember you. Thank you so much for uh, all the years of support. That's real. That's really great. Robert Hogg says, Hey, I caught you guys at the rebellion festival a couple of times. Always a highlight for me. Rebellion has a real intimate feel. Winter gardens is a great venue. Okay? Yeah. You know what? Actually like that, that's kind of right up there with festivals that have that. I mean, that's yeah. a, it's still a theater or whatever, but it's uh, yeah. such good. I loved playing those. We had some really killer shows at that fest too. Uh, Manel says, uh, do you have any memories of playing with the street dogs at the 30th anniversary show for sick of it all at Webster hall? I saw that I was there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did. All I know is that it was my dog. I took my daughter on that run <laughs> and, and you know, that the dressing room at Webster with the window or whatever. Yeah, and so I on said the left, on the left hand side. Yeah. Yeah. And when sick of it all started or whatever, Mm -hmm. I go, I go, so this is your very first New York hardcore show. <laughs> like, and she just looks out the window and like, you could just see the look on her face was just like, holy shit. Like just people on top of each other. And that was a wild show, man. Yeah. I shot some, I shot that show. It was, it was, it was, they, you know, and, and like we mentioned our friend Lorenz, you know, they really made, they really made an, a nice event of it. They really, Absolutely. It really, it did with the balloons and everything. It, it yeah. was great, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Cedric says. And Jimmy and the Murphy's Law set that night was. The, the, I'll never forget. Like I thought, the Murphy's Law set that night was amazing too. Yeah. Yeah. It was a great night. It was. It was a yeah. great night. Uh, Cedric says, "I'll never forget the pre-gig party at your birthday at the gig with the Street Dogs at Comfmel, Switzerland." Oh, I'm not shit. familiar with. I'm not familiar with Comfmel. Com, I guess you had a birthday out on the road with the Street Dogs, bro. Man, I'm trying. To, I mean, there was a lot of partying, <laughs> Drew. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I'm trying to remember it now, but I'm sure I will. I, I you know I love I love stuff like this. Hey Johnny, do you remember giving me a Quincy Police Family Day T-shirt at the Fast Lanes in New Jersey? No, <laughs> I don't even know what the Quincy Police Family Day is. <laughs> <laughs> Much less the Fast Lane in New Jersey. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. that's right. <laughs> wow, oh. that's great. That's great. Uh, I'm sure I'll there's probably a good story with it, though. I'll answer this one for you. Would Ness let him no. play the 76? Ness Paul was that off limits. Let me answer that one. No. All right. No. Well, I, I probably could have, but I, it, but uh, I think he's I still don't know. playing that. He's still playing that. I think. Yeah, he still plays it. Yeah, yeah. But it was it was just sitting in the boat, you know. In fact, we yeah. would go to those rehearsals and uh, like two weeks of those of those rehearsals. And I, I think Mike Ness probably showed up for two of them. You know what I mean? Like, so most of the time it was just the rest of us. And the other guys were pretty regular. Like there are a couple like super country guys that didn't know much about punk rock and stuff. And right. I remember the, the manager calling and saying, Hey, um, 
we need you guys to learn ball and chain or whatever a couple of social distortion songs right, and i right. just remember the other you know we didn't have the internet then we couldn't pull up what the song was yeah, so yeah, yeah. i just i'm like i got this i know how to do it let's do it you know what i'm i mean sure because this one. yeah yeah that, 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 that's great you know um one thing we haven't touched on is uh sort of a, 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 in, in lack of a better term, is it fair to say your day job? Yeah, yeah, now, sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, you've been doing it for a long time. T tell us about how you got into uh, being a barber and, and, and your passion for that. Dude, it's a, it's a hard times headline, you know, it, like basically uh, it's as predictable as it sounds, honestly. It was like uh, I needed um, – my kids were getting older. My oldest child had just graduated high school and I realized I wasn't really around for them that often. And, uh, and I thought, man, I'm not going to do that to the other kids. So yeah, I was like, I'm going to find something to do. And at the, I met Mike Gallo had done it. Ryan Packer was yeah, doing yeah, it. Like, sure. uh, yeah. there were, there were a few guys that were doing that and they were all like, it's a great way to make some money. And, um, so, and honestly, being in that barber shop is a lot like being in that van. You know, it's really just breaking balls all day long. Yeah. You know, giving street corner wisdom and uh, whatever bad advice and mediocre haircuts and you know what I mean. Is that it's, what you're doing? Is is that what you're doing uh, down in Texas on a daily basis? Do, do, you, do, you, do yeah. you go out? Do, do you do you you know eat breakfast with the kids and and kind of get in the car and go to work? Take them to school and go to work. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Good for you, man. Good for you. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Looks like you tightened it, up this guy's game right here, man. Hell yeah. 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 That's Zach. Zach. It looks like Zach. Zach's a proper man. Um, yeah. Do you want to shout where where you working? Uh, shout out. Yeah, where East End. It's uh, East End Barber in uh, in Houston on Telephone Road. We got a cool sh uh, stop shop in the back. And, you know, records and some Fred Perry's and a whole bunch of stuff and nice coffee shop next door. It's a great place. I've had guys on layovers or whatever, cause it's not too far away from the airport. I've had guys on layovers, like come in for a haircut before it's been cool. You know, um, it, it, it sounds like a nice environment, uh, you know, to be, uh, to be working in, you know? Yeah. It's a great shop. We got, um, you know, like I said, a couple members of that band, Liberty and Justice, that work there. There's this uh, young kid um, that sings for this new band called Strange Joy, who you should check out. It's kind of a lot of it's. You What's know, it called? Strange what? Strange Joy. Strange Joy. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a uh, but they're getting a lot of buzz right now around Texas and and doing a lot of great stuff and yeah. So it, this it's a pretty musical and um, street culture sort of influence shop that we have and nice. um yeah we try to highlight different graffiti artists there um and just whatever we do do a bunch of stuff there have a lot of events and um, it's a good time you know I'm, I'm just as we as we're heading towards the heading towards the door i want to ask you just about um let me get this photo up there you go uh th i see this base this base turning up again um it, yeah have has your has your equipment and your rig basically stayed the same through the years and any any gear perspective you want to give us no honestly uh i do i will use a sans amp um and then aside from the sans amp it really like that bass does all the work i swear to god i could you could plug me into any head with that thing but i've always sort of um historically played uh and i usually try to play uh, an svt head classic head and an a10 cabinet but fender's making great stuff now and i tried out uh, a fender rig for the last street dogs tour that we did and i love that too so uh, you know i might switch you know, back the, to that the, at some point the bass player uh of antide who, who's been on the show who uh, many times he designed the uh, the sans amp bass driver you know? Oh, really? And, yeah. And we have we, in the storage room it, with all the gear, we have the, we, the original Ampeg cabinet and the, and the, and the amp, yeah, the eight by 10 Ampeg cabinet and the, the eight by 10 fridge and, and the head, his night that from the seventies that he, that he used to design that thing. We still have all that shit in storage, you know? Heck yeah. 
Yeah, yeah he, works, I probably... he works for this company now. He works for uh, Fryette, you know, those high-end uh, Fryette yeah. and, Sound, and Sound City. Yeah, it's ne Neil Zum Osberg. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'd probably put the gain on the Sands Amp. I'll put it at, at probably 8 o'clock. I'll put the treble at about, uh, you know, 11 o'clock. Bass at 2 o'clock. And, yeah, I mean. Uh, do, you, I, do you use any pedals? No, just the Sands Amp. I love you, bro. I love you, bro. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Keep like, the, like the guy I play with, Tristan, same thing. Just fucking let's go. It's fucking, yeah. you know, it's fucking us. We're, we're playing a hardcore punk band. You know what I mean? Yeah. This, isn't fuck, this isn't fucking King Crimson, man. You know? Right. I love, I, I really, I, I love the, uh, Hoya did a, a, a podcast with uh, Craig and Gallo and kind of a bass player podcast. And the whole time I'm kind of like, man, if I, if I can think of that perfect tone or whatever, yeah. it's like the combination of Hoyer and Craig, you know what I mean? Like you're getting the, you're getting the, the top end of the strings from Craig and you're getting that, like no one's getting yeah. that, no one's getting that low end sound that Hoya gets, you know what I mean? Like, but you're not hearing a lot of string. You're, you're just kind of feeling it and, you know what I mean? Uh, Craig sound, Craig sound is not an accident. You know, he's, he's close with, you know, Neil and uh, like, you know, Craig works on his sound. That That's not just. Oh like, yeah. Yeah. You know, oh he, yeah. He really gives a lot of, of thought. Sound. Yeah. Yeah. He does. Yep. Uh, Larry, the hunter uh, uh, from Kings never die says, yeah, if it ain't broke. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, but the people get, here's a question from our, our resident uh, historian, Chucky Brown says, any memories of recording the track Angels Calling from the 2018 album Stand for Something or Die for Nothing? Cool track with Boston rapper Slain. Any memories? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. We, uh, so I was producing that record and we were, I had called Slain to do, I was having a hard time with another song on the record and I called Slain and I was like, man, I mean, we had never tried anything remotely involving, you know, a, a hip hop thing, obviously on a street dogs thing. It's not sure. whatever the vibes totally different good. or whatever. Yeah. But yeah. I thought if we were ever going to do something like that, or maybe Slane had an idea for the track that was just kind of spoken word thing. You know what I mean? That yeah. Slane could do something over or, or whatever. Like I just thought he could bring an element to it. And, uh, and he came in and we were, I was recording, Mike, our singer on Angels Calling. And when Slane came into the control room or when he was in the studio, he was he was listening to me recording Mike. So all of a sudden he pulls out a, a pad of paper and he just kind of wrote tons of verses. And uh, and he goes, can I get in there? You know, can can you record me? I'm like, man, I go, this ain't even the track that we're, we were going to get you on or whatever. And he's like, but I got something great for this. So we ended up I ended up, uh, we put him in there and he spit this insane verse out That's great. on like the two or three takes or something like that, like nothing. And, uh, and, and he probably spent 10, 15 minutes writing it, but it's, it's, it's awesome. That's cool. Yeah. It just, and it, it just really came, added it something. It didn't, sound, it didn't sound like, oh, street dogs are doing a fucking hip hop thing. Like what, what are they trying to do? It sounds super organic or whatever you know what i mean yeah that's that's great well hey we had a nice we had a good time today and uh i want to thank you for coming on the show it was great uh it was loose uh any anybody you want to shout out anybody you want to thank man i want to thank i want to thank my family out there you know who you are um and uh yeah just i have no if you had told me that i'd be pushing 50 years old and still doing this punk rock and hardcore thing i'd I wouldn't have believed you. So, you know, thanks to people that come see the bands and listen to the music and all that kind of shit. I, you know, none of us could do this without those people. So. Absolutely. You know. All right. Well, thank you, man. Uh, it was, it was a nice Sunday afternoon and uh, I hope to see you in person soon, man. Thank you, Drew. I appreciate you very much. All the best to you and your family, man. I appreciate it. Same to you. Take care. All right. Later, brother. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. That was a nice show. That was great. Sid, did you enjoy yourself? 
Did you enjoy yourself? Of course I did, Drew. Yeah, he was great. He was a great guest. I have I have a special guest, but I'm not going to say who it is, though. You'll see after the show. Oh, boy. I'm not going to turn the phone around because that person who shall remain nameless has to stay quiet. Oh, all right. But anyway. All right. Yeah, th thanks for everybody. I I'll, I'll get back with you in a second, Sid. Hey, thank you, Tony, um, Gary, everyone, Michael, uh, you know, Grunge and Grime Soap Company. Thank you for supporting the show. Uh, it was. It was a great show. I knew it was going to be a great show. I don't have that feeling for all of them, but I, I knew this was going to be great. You know, when, when I have such a, you know, when, when we have such a connection with the guest, uh, AK, yeah, man, AK Ray got some love today. That was cool, man. Um, yeah, it was great. Yep. Yep. Good one. Thank you, Scout. Thank you, Chris, everybody, man. So nice, nice Sunday. Um, what's up next is um, one week from today. There is no Wednesday show. One week from today is uh, Mr. Nate Newton will be on one week from today. So we'll do some homework before then. Yeah, Johnny was great. Johnny was great, Robert, for, for sure. And your beloved band, the Stone Roses, got some love today, Robert Hogg. Huh? I know you love that band. So, you know, I, I, I got to say that... Um, I like when we mix it up, you know, when some, when we do a record, that's kind of out of left field and it's like, what, what, you know, but, but yeah. Is that right, Larry? Larry the Hunter, love the street dogs. Great songs. Yeah. And Larry Kelly, Nate, good guy. Yeah. Well, we're looking forward to good guy, Nate, uh, coming on one week from today. Um, is that right? Robert Hogg needs an interview on here. I feel that would be a good show. We had Robert on a couple times early on. And yes, Robert, I know you love the Stone Roses. I know it's one of your favorite bands. That's great, man. Love when we mix it up. And we got some, we got some mix it up shows coming up too, man. You know it's gonna be a great, you know it's gonna be a great mix it up show that's coming up. This one right here. Cat Popper is gonna be a really interesting guest. She's very funny. Uh, she's an incredibly, incredibly talented bass player. I mean, she's played with Willie Nelson, Jack White. She's funny as fuck, um, really knowledgeable. This is this going to be a good one. I'll mix it up a little bit, you know. Um, so that said, um, thanks, everybody. Um, I'll see you in a week. Uh, if you're a patron, I'll probably see you before then. Um, until then. You know what to do with yourselves, right? Do good things and good things will come to you.